Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Oh yeah, there it is. Sounds like welcome back, Connor. Get ready for it. Here we go. There it oh, is. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to get your groove on. Geez, I was just gonna jam with it for the rest of the forty-five minutes. I could have <laughs> done gone, that. Put it, it, it on a loop. Nice. Bye. Put <laughs> it on a loop. It's probably the. It's a, I don't know. We'll carry it out as a video uh, series for uh, uh, you know, exercise tape. That's what it. I'm, I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Brent, Brent and so Chris and guests. Gotta get their Jane Fonda on. Exactly. We'll get the leggings out. And we'll, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, oh, the boy, the oh, learning boy. loop. We'll call it. We'll start a new podcast. The, the learning <laughs> loop. Good. Oh, Come get stuck in the loop. Hey, look at this. We got people dropping in from all over the world and dropping in some weather reports too. That's always fun to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's humid in Philadelphia. It's rain soaked in Nebraska. It's sunny in London. Look at all these things. Look at all these places. You actually sound like a weatherman. Oh, uh, do you know what? I'm coming off of like a cold from two weeks ago, and I've still got a little bit of that radio guy voice that you get when, when you come off a cold where right. everything sounds just a little deeper and a little Your voice. more resonant. Yeah, this is not my normal voice, gang. I don't normally sound like this. Good morning. Normally, I sound kind of like this. <laughs> but um, <laughs> where nice. is this coming from? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, you know, it's a Wednesday morning, folks. Hey, look, we got people from Ireland hanging out with us. Now we've certainly hit the big time. Well, in Montenegro, too. Montenegro. Oh, Michelle is London. telling us it's flesh melting it's in Texas. Flesh but... melting in is Texas. That really, is that really weather or is that more just like, I don't know, special effects? The byproduct. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, I feel you, Michelle. Uh, Arizona is definitely not currently cozy, so Too cozy. it's it's a it's a painful thing. But anyways, hey, let's kick this pony on a Wednesday morning. Chris, who's hanging Ooh. out with us today? Well, gang, we have Shannon Tipton back with us. Uh, Shannon's been with us a couple of times before, but it's been a while, and it's yeah, absolutely it's very cool and lovely, lovely to catch up again. Shannon, there may actually be some folks in our uh, in our session here today who haven't met you before, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Shannon Tipton, and I am the owner of Learning Rebels. And Learning Rebels helps organizations think differently about the way that they put training in front of their people today. So that's our goal is to help organizations think more about their people and less about their programs. Um, and you, you can find me in all the usual places, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, Instagram, mm -hmm. all those fun places. And of course, you know, learningrebels.com. And I'm here in Chicago with all of my babies. I've got my doggies down here and I think you can still see Jack in the chair over my shoulder. So the whole family is here. Let's let me give let me give everybody the full shot. There we there go. go. There There's he is. Jack. Oh, oh little Jack, Jack. He's sleeping. He's Just like, a little okay. Furball. Little furball. He's like, all right. I, I've seen the beginning of this. Now I can go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we're bored. We're boring, guys. We're boring. <laughs> yeah, You're like, we ah, another day, another video. If we rouse the puppy, we know we will have hit something good. We've hit a nerve. Yes. Mm. So, but we're talking about something that should be hitting a nerve with folks today. Something that we probably, I don't believe we've ever talked about, which is why I thought this would make for a great topic today, no Shannon. Way. Yeah. So we're talking about experiments. What the heck? Why should instructional designers be creating experiments? What's up with that? What's up with that? Why not? Right. 
All right. right. Sure. Why, why you got not? Me done. Sold. Done. Done. <laughs> done. So we can all go back to our day. Um, mm. No, really, this all came about, you know, as you said in your write up there, Brent, is the work that I've been doing with Laura Overton and Michelle Ockers over with our, um, our with our side work, which is the Emerging Stronger uh, initiative that we've been working on. And part of what we've discovered is through a variety of conversations and surveys and through some of our master classes that we've held and some of our own independent research is we just don't spend enough time experimenting with what could be out there. You know, and it's what I've always labeled as um, L and D's want to race to a solution. And that's just because, you know, we're, we're problem solvers, right? So, you know, HR comes knocking at the door or risk management comes knocking at the door and they have a problem and we want to be good support people. And we want to, we want to solve that problem for them. And we've talked about this ad nauseum in the field about making sure that you're solving the right problem, et cetera. But this actually goes deeper than that. This goes down to let's not even assume the problem. You know, let's really play around and see if what we think might be a solution maybe isn't, right? And how is it that we can then tackle the idea of building towards a solution? And that's when I stumbled upon the concept of Trojan mice, which some of you may have heard about. And Trojan mm -hmm. mice, what, th what that is, is just a bunch of little experiments that are geared towards bringing an idea forward. And that's all that they do is to bring an idea forward and dare I say, even set us up for failure because they're so small. If it fails, it's okay, right? We can just toss it aside and we can yeah. say, okay, well now let's try this. And so rather than thinking, well, let's put together um, this big leadership development program. Why don't we play around with some smaller ideas before we start thinking about putting out yet another leadership development university or initiative, right? So let's play around with some ideas. And that's, that's kind of the gist of where we were going with this. Very cool. I, I was yeah. thinking um, as we were getting started, I mean, we build these big things <clears throat> and a lot of us work, you know, with the ADI model, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's actually, if you, if you look at it with a certain lens, there's, there's kind of a, an aspect of experiment in that, you know, if you're doing the full ADI, there is that evaluation at the end, you know, what works, what isn't, and then taking something and, and improving it. So I think yeah. maybe we can even argue that if we don't do it in a big way, we, we're, st we're still kind of applying the ADI model. We've now analyzed something, we've designed our little experiment, and then we've got the evaluation. Did it work? But we're just, but you're talking about it on a, on a sort of micro scale. We're on a very the, small scale. Yeah. And there's, and you could take ADI, absolutely, because ADI in of itself is a project management tool. Yeah. You know, exactly. um, and, and so, which has been applied to instructional design. And that's the roots. And so now if we did that, we, we probably could come out the other end with something that might be usable. Now, where we, where we think about this is when someone comes knocking at your door and they say, uh, our salespeople, our salespeople just are not, they, they just aren't making the sales that they need to make. And so we need a sales training program. Now, those of you who are in the chat, you know, that sounds familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Automatically, somebody's coming to you and they're knocking on your door and they want a course, right? Okay. And they're done that. And they're done that. And we've all been there, done that. All right. So now if we back that truck up just a little bit, and rather than thinking about what problem that we're, is it that we're trying to solve, how about if we reframed that question and we actually turned it into a question? So now what is the question that needs answering at this point? So if our salespeople aren't making the sales, 
if, if the sales team is struggling to make sales of our new product, what's the question here that needs answered? <laughs> Craig says, we got a problem. Training fixes it. <laughs> right? But really, so let's just take apart that statement. So they're, they're knocking at your door and they say, our sales, our sales people are struggling to sell our new product. What's really the question here? What's wrong with the salespeople? <laughs> What's wrong with the salespeople? What's wrong with the product? What's wrong with the product, yeah. <laughs> right? So, you know, it's very simple where we think about if we pull back and we think the, the real question here is why are the salespeople struggling? Right? Oh, yeah, why, why, are says, why aren't people buying? buying? Right? Yeah. I see Kim in there. Why aren't people buying? Right. Why are the salespeople not performing? Why are the salespeople struggling? That's the question that needs answered. So we're not at problem solving mode yet. So a lot of times we will automatically jump to, well, the salespeople can't negotiate. The salespeople don't understand the, the features and benefits. The salespeople don't have, um, they don't have all the resources in front of their hands in order to explain the features and benefits. So we automatically jump to what might be pre presupposed as a solution. We're not asking the question. And the question is, why are they struggling? Okay, so now once we've got that question on the table, then what we can do is we can put together a hypothesis around that, right? And, and so when you think about why are salespeople struggling to sell the product, then your hypothesis, your if-then statement might be the, the foundation of a bajillion different little experiments. If, you know, if the salespeople spent more time with research and development, maybe <laughs> then they may be able to sell the product. If the salespeople had resources on their mobile phones, maybe they'll be able to sell the product. If salespeople were able to uh, collaborate more in a community of other salespeople, then maybe they'll be able to sell more product. So then when you think about it in that way, now what you're doing is you're thinking of all of the different possibilities that may be underpinning the struggle. Brainstorming, Oops. right? Right. Buddy's asking, Buddy's asking in, in the question panel, do you think there's also an issue with asking the right question to the right people? Oh, oh absolutely. Actually, Buddy just... Buddy just expanded on that, even while I was reading. <laughs> By this, I mean that sometimes if you ask those knee deep in the issue, the actual salespeople, then they may have a different answer than their managers or leaders that may have additional oversight or insight into other global issues like upcoming product launches, competitors, offers, those sorts of things. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why these little if then statements can help you solve all of those issues. Because the big question on the table, the big question on the table there's no doubt about that. The salespeople aren't able to sell the product. Boom. Okay. We're not getting yeah. into why they're not selling the product yet. We just want to uncover what the foundational question is. So why are the salespeople struggling to sell the product? Now you're right. Everyone here, Brent, Chris, Shannon, we're going to have three different perspectives as to why the salespeople aren't able to sell the product. But what you can do is I can take Brent's point of view and Chris's point of view, and I can put those into if then statements and play around with little experiments and find out really what's happening. Right. And so, and if you do that, then you just may stumble upon, you, you just may stumble upon it. If we said, if the salespeople were more, uh, were more directly involved in communication, then they may be able to sell more product. Okay, so that might tell me, what if we created a podcast? What if we created a podcast that was nothing but the product? It did nothing but talk about our new product. And if we linked in the salespeople to that communication piece, would that be helpful? We don't know that. 
but that's a small little experiment that we can try that has no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. And I think the emphasis here, when I'm hearing, you know, you, you've used the word small and, and little, et cetera. That also, uh, to me, is um, a, probably a, a good lever for us when we're talking to, you know, management or those, those, those folks needing this you know, problem to be solved. Because, I mean, so often, as we've already described, they come to us, they say, we have this problem, make us a training course. And part of our ability sometimes to, you know, within our organizational culture to be able to say, are you sure? Um, but maybe instead of a saying, are you sure, which can be sometimes be interpreted as challenging authority or challenging, uh, you know, status quo might feel risky sometimes. Um, but if, what if you can at least throw out the offer, well, let's try a couple of small things first. That keeps the budget small. Maybe we find the secret there instead of putting in all these hours mm -hmm. to build the big thing, which we, we may or may not still need. But let's let's right. try a couple of small things first. Um, and using that, you know, that word small, which indicates smaller budget, you know, maybe um, gives us, a, I think, maybe a conversation uh, tool that we can have, too, with helping other people to to buy into this idea. That's I think that's kind of cool. Right. And I'm reading I'm reading the chats and, mm. and the, the comments are coming fast and furious here. So <laughs> Sorry about I, that. I think they read the comments, too. <laughs> 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 I love it. Yeah, yeah, were, yeah. Yeah, they, um, it, the thing that's really interesting, I mean, we, we definitely should hit up those comments, but it gets me thinking, um, you know, a lot about the, the time pressures that everybody is under. And maybe the, um, you know, when, when they come to us and ask us or tell us, hey, we've got a problem and we think training can fix it. Uh, you know, I keep thinking that, that maybe, um, that maybe those particular projects aren't good ones. And, and maybe I'm wrong here in my thinking about this because typically now it's on their radar, right? Now it's on the sales manager's radar and they really, really want something done. And typically mm -hmm. they get their way, right? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if they've are, if they're already sold on it on what they think the solution needs to be, you either need to do a whole lot of influencing or you just need to get done what they want done. When I was thinking of little experiments, I was thinking of how do we find little areas where we can be impactful in the business mm -hmm. kind of quietly and performing yes. little experiments with those yes. groups. I got on the side, real little ones. It doesn't take a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of time, anything like that. We just do a little thing and say, Oh, I, you know, can we help this company or, you know, or try out a new tool or try out a new methodology or try out a, a new solution of some sort that is, you know, just easy to do, but quick to do to get some quick results. And if you do a bunch of those kind of fly them under the radar, at some point, something will hit and you'll be able to take that to management and say, we've done a couple little tests on this. We see this as providing a lot of value. Now we want to scale it up instead of trying to propose a solution and say, this is how much it's going to cost to scale it up across the board right out the chute. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's great. We should be doing more of that. You know, I, I proudly proclaim to be the queen of the under the radar person, you know, in, in my <laughs> past organizations, there was always something that I was trying out, you know, and if it failed, eh, no harm, no foul. If it succeeded, that went into a pocket somewhere that I could pull out and say, Hey, look what we did. This worked. Can we build on this? And what, why that becomes important is when we get to the pilot stage of putting together a training program, that is usually where we do most of our experimenting is when we hit the pilot stage. The, the issue with that is that's too late because we've already decided on a solution. So all we're doing is we're testing the variables of that solution. Is the timing right? Are the activities right? You know, are we targeting the right audience, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so we've already made a decision on a solution. We're, it's too late at that point. You can't pull back. So now what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to step back and think more broadly 
about potential solutions, not really solutions, but potential ideas that will move you towards the right solution because you may determine and there's salespeople or sales managers. I'm just going to stay on the sales theme right now because that's where we started is yes, they want training classes, but why do they want training classes? They, they do not want to pull their people off of the street and sit them in a training class just for the heck of it. They don't. So they, they want something from that. So they yeah. want more sales. They want more productivity. They want something to happen because something isn't happening. They need and that so measurement. Now, right. So now our job is to try to ask the questions that say, okay, Mr. Miss, Mrs., salesperson what what is it what is your real question and we don't often take enough time because yeah. we realize that everybody's in a hurry and everybody has their hair on fire for wanting to put something together now this is where i would ask you when you have these conversations with the business don't use i challenge you here's your challenge for the day <laughs> try to have a conversation today without using the words learning training or program seriously you're right and i know then, <clears throat> right and if you took those words out of your vocabulary even with yourself you might be surprised to see how many other things bubble up how many other ideas tend to bubble up right and yeah. so this is where experiments and these trojan mice can really help move the needle when it comes to digging in and really finding out what some of the issues is, because you may discover that it's not it it's not a training issue. It's a community issue. It's a community issue because salespeople aren't collaborating. They're not sharing information. They don't have a home base in which to share ideas and thoughts and opinions. Right. So it's not a training issue. It's a community issue. And that may need to be piloted at some point because maybe your sales people or your sales department isn't willing to put, you know, all of their faith and trust in that. But you, you can still do Trojan mice experiments to see whether or not this particular idea is going to gain traction. And that's all that we're asking here is yeah. can we get these little ideas that will gain traction to a larger solution down the road? I think the challenge is for the managers, I think, right? Because there's a lot of, um, I'm, I'm kind of going back to Craig's question about, you know, influence and, uh, you know, you've got, maybe you're in an environment that doesn't encourage a lot of experimentation and whatnot. And I think a, a lot of this conversation does kind of revolve around managers. And maybe we shift the question a little bit here and say, and ask the chat room too, you know, do you allow your people to do little experiments? And, uh, you know, is it part of your workflow? Is it part of the day-to-day -day process of your training team? Like, do you work that into your conversations with your people that are working on your team? You know, how many you know, little experiments if you run today. And if you don't, maybe it's something you can think about as far as, um, you know, different things coming up. And I'll, I'll make a quick point to one of Craig's earlier comments as well about, um, is this the same as sort of iterative design and development? And I would say what we're talking about comes before that. Yes. I would think, yes. I would think many iterations, it's more of a tactical thing. Once you've decided on a solution, maybe there's a production process that it requires a loop of just iterative improvements, testing, iterative development throughout. Um, I think that's something different than the Trojan mice, but maybe, um, you can clarify for us, but I, I think that's the case We're, you know, we're, we're talking right. about setting up hypotheses, right. And just testing right. against those mini hypotheses and, and seeing if we could possibly have a solution and an impact just in case it fails, then we don't scuttle a much larger project because we made a decision that was kind of just a guess. Correct. Correct. And you're absolutely right. So all of what I'm talking about comes way before any decision as to what um, programs, if a program is even needed. And that's what really what we're asking us to really reimagine and take ourselves out of our comfort zone and think about 
where where can we take a left turn right so you know a lot of times we'll say well why not try this or why don't we try that and again questions like this well why not why not try well that's great why not you know although i might ask you to think even more broadly and think about well you know here's a crazy idea let's just do this you know let's let's find out who already has a has something that's working does marketing already have a podcast can we piggyback on that right so are are there areas in which we can share um, is there a salesperson out there who's doing something fabulous? And I saw this already in the comments. Is there somebody out there already doing something fabulous that we can um, bend and tweak or apply, right? So yeah. a, not a best practice, not a best practice. We're not talking about best practices because we all know that best practices when lifted from one arena to another, you know, failed spectacularly. So we want to see <laughs> whether or not uh, an idea can be flexed upon, but then there are those crazy outside of the box ideas, you know, let, we'll go back to the podcast. Well, okay. Podcasts. Usually you've got a forum like this where people are having big umbrella discussions. Well, why not make it more product centered? Yeah. Why not make mm -hmm. it product centric? Where, Absolutely. You know, and I, I think a lot of people are doing that actually now it's, it's, it was a slow uptick, a slow but lift. But I hear, but it, but I hear happens. a lot of people doing it. Yeah, it is right. happening. Yep. Yeah. So now it's not so much of a crazy idea. And now it takes the place of a whole training class, right? Because a lot yeah. of training classes for product was simply about bringing people together and talking about the product. Well, we don't need to bring people into an eight hour class in order to talk about the product. So this would be a crazy idea. Let's just roll this out. In conjunction yeah. with not saying that this needs to displace something that you already have, but let's let's try this on the side and see what happens. Or, or those of you who have Slack or Teams, what would happen if you had user-generated video talking about the different product and those little videos were uploaded into Slack where people could um, comment on it? What would happen if we tried that? Yeah. Right? And we you know, and we've talked about a lot of those. Part. Yeah, we've talked a lot about those. A lot of those things that you were that you were you know rattling off, like the podcast. But there's other things like the marketing that you mentioned, and um, even just emails. Like what currently exists in the communication exactly. realm, and that how can we use. possibly embed into that? So maybe there's a department that sends out a weekly or a monthly email of some sort that has an update of things. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could try working with them and say, you know what, maybe we could put a little paragraph in there that just educates people on one tiny little thing, right. uh, you know, and, and, you know, maybe everybody, maybe not everybody will read it, but it's low hanging fruit. And if somebody sees it and goes, oh, I didn't know that, then that's mm -hmm. a good enough win because it was an easy lift, all that kind of stuff. Right. I mean, it's yeah, like, exactly. I think lots of little exactly. things we can, we can try. Yeah. Text message, text message that video to everybody, you know, people who have corporate phones, right. You know, we can send a text message with a link to a video, boom, done, you know? And so it's just a matter of finding out again, if we go back to, it has to go back to the original question. So the original question was, why are salespeople struggling? So now what you what we need to do is we have to think about that word struggle. What does struggle mean? And what does that look like in their life? So if yeah. I'm a salesperson and I'm struggling, what does that look like in the wild? And so, and here's the thing too, typically when we wanna answer that question, we go to the A of Addy, right? And we think we are so smart. We're going to do some analysis, right? And, we're, and our analysis is so good that we're going to be able to nail the solution right off the bat. And we're going to just know exactly what the solution is, right? I mean, it's the hubris of our industry <laughs> and I see it all the time. And, um, and then they wonder, all of a sudden it fails or... Uh, you know, or they you can't get funding for the solution that they've right. decided is the right solution or whatever. 
but I think I think this approach, if you rally up, as you put it, the if then statements or the hypotheses, right? You lay mm-hmm. out a bunch of little ones. We think it might be this. We think it could be this. We think it could be this. Run a few tests against it and just see. Right. I, I think it's an, yeah, it's it's a it's an excellent way to go about it. And Buddy has a great point up here too. Just want to give him a big shout out. That one of the best things a manager can do is to create an environment that encourages experimentation and makes it safe to fail. And yeah, we read about that all the time, right? <laughs> right. And, um, Jesse follows up with its psychological safety, the freedom to make interpersonal risks, like try and fail, ask questions, question the status quo. Um, and, and things like that. And a lot right, of times right. it's hard to do that, right? I mean, it's some it environments do that. just <laughs> don't foster that. And some personalities just aren't geared towards making that sort that of creative happen. mindset. Yeah. And I, and this is why the group becomes so important, you know? Um, so even if you're a, an L and D department of one there, there's a community out there like this, you know, or, you know, learning rebels, you know, it's, so there's, there's, there are communities out there that are, it's okay. You can, to... you can pitch rebels. It's totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but it, but it really, it is about uh, having that sort of support mechanism for you to think, well, I want to try my ideas here, or I want to get feedback on those ideas somewhere else and to see whether or not I'm headed in the right direction, you know, and, we make this a much bigger deal than it has to be. <laughs> we we really overthink this and we're very concerned about a lot of things. Um, you know, as, as I'm reading in the chat, there's a lot of concern about a lot of different things, which is, which is great. This is, this is why the L and D industry is a group of lovely people because mm-hmm. we're very worried about a lot of things. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is step back from that worry, you know, so let's take psychological safety, for example. Yes, absolutely. Very important. We want to set the stage to have a place where people feel like it's safe to express themselves, safe to uh, fail either in a little way or even spectacularly. Right. You know, so we want to be able to have those places, but don't wait for those places to occur before you do something. And I know that that's hard because it's like, oh, I'm taking a risk personally now. You know, I'm putting myself out there and I don't know if I'm ready for that. Well, under the radar. So you take five people and you say, I'm going to test sending them text messages every Monday about a new product. Let's see if this generates any conversation. Let's see what the response is. Let's see if conversations between salespeople and potential customers become easier. Let's see what happens with just five people. And then if it works now, okay, so now let's set some groundwork. Now let's start, you know, nurturing some conversations so that way we can move forward on a larger scale you know, to set ourselves up for uh, a more larger success area, right? And so sometimes we get so concerned about the peripherals that they get in the way of us trying to do something that could be wildly successful within our organizations. And I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that it's a hubris issue. I think it's, um, I think it's some people being new to the industry and they're naive. I think some people in our industry have gotten some bad advice. Um, I think some people are just entrenched and being risky is scary. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I don't think it's necessarily because we're so full of ourselves that we believe that we absolutely know the absolutes. And I'm not saying that that does not exist. It it does exist and it exists in any industry, not just ours. So, but I think let's put the light on where it deserves to be, you know, and help people, you know, be able to move forward and think differently about how they want to approach 
experiments or thinking differently about how we even get to the idea of putting training in front of people. Chris, mm-hmm. I keep stepping on you. What, what's on your mind? I know I see your <clears throat> wheels <No>. turning. <laughs> yeah, that's that, and, and the wheels. Yeah, yeah. No, no kidding. So here's um here's another piece of of, of something that that I I've been mulling over as we've been talking too is that um I mean these littler experiments they they limit the big risk right they they were not pushing a whole pile of effort and time and then seeing something is going to fail. So we can, we, they, they come with low risk. That's part of our argument or, or our conversation with the people who need to be convinced that we should you know, be able to try something like this. Um, we were just talking about marketing a heartbeat ago too. Um, and you know, one of the things that marketing does often is AB testing. So right. we yes. have something, but we've got, got two variations on it. And, and we're trying to hone in mm-hmm. on which of those two is the more successful mm-hmm. way to go. And so this also then plays into this, I think, because this smallness of it lets us actually, you know, maybe gather, you know, some data, even though it's maybe small scale, but we're not trying to, We're again, we're not investing that big whack of time in making two different training programs and then watching right. hmm, how, do, how do these result? We're, we're limiting the, the cost and the effort, but it gives us that chance to incorporate that a b testing like we're going to do this thing but we're going to do it this way for a small batch and and this way for another you know batch of folks and just Mm -hmm. see which resonates more which which produces some you know what kind of different results we get on on that too um and so i I find this idea really empowering from that perspective too i you're absolutely right you're absolutely right because you can break those small experiments down to even smaller bits right and do Mm -hmm. that a b testing for it so if we go back to the um, podcast idea it's let's do a podcast but let's do one podcast on product knowledge and another one on sales tips yeah let's see which one has the larger impact yeah. right and or even so your, your note you about can test those yeah your note about t- you know t- messaging text messaging five people well, maybe mm-hmm. it's 10 people, but five people were messaging them with something and the other five are getting a little bit different. And we're just we're right. trying to see which might produce a different result. And it might not even be completely different content. It might be focused or, or even the way we use language, you know, that, right. uh, you know, we're talking about it, you know, uh, thou shalt. And, and over here, hey, guys, like, the, you know, sneaky, or what, you know, whatever. Like, there's all kinds of variations of this that we can play around with to see where where we get to, you know, resonance and, uh, and results and, and, and then compare them, et cetera. I, I think we could even roll this conversation up into HR and retention, right? Because a lot of folks leave jobs because they don't feel like there's enough room to grow and enough room to learn. And certain personalities just need to be able to do this kind of of sort of rebel thinking, right? Like doing Mm -hmm. the, if flying under the radar, trying something new. Cause sometimes, I mean, let's be honest, right? Sitting around and doing instructional design can sometimes get repetitive in certain companies (laughs) because you've got the same content, the same topic, the same product types, all that kind of stuff, right? And you could in theory talk about this as a retention tool. It's like, Hey, I've got a couple people on my staff that look like they're getting kind of bored. I'm going to give them some stretch projects or give them the opportunity to say, Hey, why don't, you know, why don't the two of you pair up and figure out something that you think you'd like to work on that would be exciting for you that would benefit the company or something like that, right? Craft these ways and make it a psychologically safe and risk-free environment and say, it's okay if it fails but I just mm-hmm. want you to try. I, I just, the reason why that comes to me and is so fresh in my mind, early in my career, I had uh, a manager that gave me that opportunity and it, it launched the trajectory of the rest of my career. And it was, um, it, it can be a very, very empowering thing. So if you're, if you're, if you're looking if you're a manager and, and you're looking for a way to engage your folks, sometimes it's just giving them a challenge and, yeah, and giving them an opportunity to, to take on a challenge. So mm-hmm. just wanted to throw that angle out there. Right. Case, no, and I agree. You know, I think it's because you never know where these great ideas are going to come from. Yeah. You know, a lot or of go. Depend, <laughs> right, or go. We depend on quote unquote subject matter experts. Um, and I use the word, and I use quotes because a lot of times we play subject matter experts as simply the people who've been around the longest, 
they're not necessarily the people who are the most expert in what they're doing, right? And so there might be a person hiding in a corner somewhere and they, they really are, and they really have great ideas and, and let's use them. And I'm, I'm looking at the question here that came from Buddy and um, talking about if then statements and usually it's about diagnostics. So when it comes to organizational people issues, is it possible considering that there are so many variables? Yes, it is possible. And you're right, there are a lot of variables. And so this is why you really have to think about where do we need this if then statement to go and what variables within that if then statement are we going to test? And so that might mean then that we have to create several if then statements of around one, what I like to call the foundational question. So again, if we go back and we think about why are people struggling People are, people are people. And so there's going to be just so many different directions this can go into, but we have to think about what's the normative here. So what's the normative struggle that people are facing and what can we test against that normative rather than trying to do what I, what I call, you know, the Martian it's like, oh, what if a Martian came down from Mars and sat next to me and gave me a kiss? What would I do then? It's like, what are the odds of that? So I'm not <laughs> going to deal with that. Let's deal with what seems to be the norm and then build out around it. And yeah, it's yeah. dealing with people is always going to be tricky at best, you know, because people are people and they're going to change on you. But let's do what we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it sounds trite. I realize that you're like, well, that's not a solution. Well, <laughs> sorry, no, it's not. But I, I wish I had that magic wand. But this, I think, when we're talking about these Trojan mice experiments, and we're talking about, let me let me put this into order for you. So the first thing is finding the foundational question. What is the foundational question? That's your first step. Okay, so if somebody comes to you with a problem, you have to ask a question. Don't try to put this into a learning objective, people. I know that's the habit, but let's not do that. We just want to ask one very basic question. Then what we want to do is we want to say, if this happened, then we will see this result. That's what an if-then statement is. If we do this, then this will happen. And the if this will happen, that should address the, the crux of your foundational question. Yeah. And then, and then you start planning your, your, that's crazy talk experiment, <laughs> right? And start doing those in small little pockets and small little bits and bites and see what occurs. And don't be afraid to challenge yourself, you know, um, throw that uh, flip chart up on a wall or open up that mural board or that jam board and just start throwing ideas out there and then take the crazy ones and see which ones will help you determine if your hypothesis is correct. And if that hypothesis will then answer that struggling question. Right. And so that's, that's putting that in order for you to help you. And this is all before we've even said the word, learning training program <laughs> or instructional design or, or instructional learning design. objectives or, or... or root cause analysis <laughs> god love us root cause analysis i'm all for a good root cause analysis a good fishbone diagram <laughs> right so we, we get in our own way with this i'm asking you to free the mice okay let let the mice go let your brains go and think about what if we tried this? Would this help address the foundational question? The foundational question, right? Which every yeah. leader wants answered. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I, in the in the spirit of experimentation, I just want to throw out to the community and all you folks hanging out um, uh, as we get close to the end of our uh, time today. Um, I can... I can help you guys do experiments. If you're looking to do experiments in a new authoring tool, uh, <laughs> Domino is nice. sponsors this thing. Oh. So I'm just going to throw this out there and you can just uh, hit me up anytime. Sorry. I just felt like it was a good, uh, 
<laughs> it, it's a it's a good way to experiment pain free no 30 day trial you can hit me up and uh well we'll i'll help you run experiments <laughs> i just threw a link in too uh i nice. didn't i didn't see that one i didn't see that one coming at all actually brett you completely th that's totally innovative that's an innovative <laughs> That 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 was if, a safe to fail experiment. <laughs> exactly. If I try this, then <laughs> that's right. Crazy talk. How about no that? If I and I, sometimes I just like living on the edge, just like mm. when the music pops up and it says time to go, people. <laughs> Shannon, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we absolutely love having you with us here. Throw in your own contact info, you know, the chat there where folks can connect with you and, and, uh, and find you in various places. Um, gang, as well, we do have the LinkedIn group that uh, where we try to keep the idiotic conversation uh, going. So, uh, and I think Brent, there we go. It's like Brent and I are like thinking together, right? He says it, I type in the link, I say it, he types in the link. Oh my gosh. Oh, like crazy. That's, that's the only one I can do it for, though. So. <laughs> Yeah, we've only got two links to throw into the, so it's 50-50 that we're going to get it right. <laughs> and both of them are good to try. So. Gang, as always, some ab absolutely fabulous thoughts and reflections and questions thrown into the chat. And it's so cool to see that stuff going on. We will see everybody again next week. And in the meantime, let's dance on out of here. Let's do it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Shannon. Good job. Mice, that's right. Go hang out with Shannon on Fridays, learning rebels. <laughs> Adios, everybody. <laughs>